Welcome to the FeeCast, your weekly dose of economic thinking brought to you by the Foundation for Economic Education. My name is Richard Lawrence, and we are here today on a new set, or at least partially new. We have chairs, we have a sign, we have these lovely people looking at us, which we should probably acknowledge at some point when we start referencing their ideas. But we are here as ever with Anna Jane Peril, Dan Sanchez, and Marianne March with Pink Hair. And the pink hair is, again, one of those things you wanted to do before your birthday, right? Yeah. I'm turning 30 at the end of the month, so this is item number 28, 30 new things before I turn 30. Excellent. 30. <laughs> well, it looks great. Thanks. And we are happy to have everyone on the set today. We are talking this week about sort of something that we were discussing last week, which is banning of all of the things. And it seems like that's happening more and more in that left-wing location of California. <laughs> Last week, we talked about some local municipalities such as Santa Barbara banning plastic straws mm-hmm. and how Starbucks has decided to ban plastic straws throughout all of their facilities nationwide. This week, we're talking about something a little similar but different. And that is in San Francisco, that hub of activity and commerce and business and wealth that it is, they are considering or they're actually working toward banning free food inside Mm -hmm. corporate cafeterias, which is an interesting twist on the (laughs) corporate slash government banning of things bandwagon. And so, Dan, what is happening in San Francisco where companies up to this point are offering their employees food at no charge? Yeah, so we have an article on the website today, San Francisco's protectionist attempt to ban company cafeterias written by our former co-host here, Brittany Hunter. And um, she talks about how it really is a protectionist move because the idea, the, the special interest that's really pushing for this are the local restaurants. And the local restaurants are arguing, hey, if we can't compete with free. The, all these tech companies are, are offering free food to their employees and it's keeping them from going out uh, onto the street and finding a restaurant to, to eat lunch uh, and um, and it's keep it's keeping money from the local economy, and so they think, okay, well, we can force them to patronize us by shutting off that um, that al- alternative source of food. And the rationale here is what exactly? Why exactly would sort of a, a city like San Francisco be? against companies having free food. I mean, this sounds like the greatest thing ever. I wish we did it at fee, but we do it sometimes. We get pizza, we get fried chicken. But like on a regular basis, we cannot, as a company, afford to have a chef. Mm -hmm. This is a problem for some people because... Well, um, the the idea was that San Francisco was hoping that the, these tech companies would, would come in and they would, they would bring in not only tax revenue, but, but business, but, sure. but local business. And so, mm-hmm. so their, their argument is that, oh, well, they're being antisocial, that they're, you know, they're commuting in and they're just driving straight into work and then and just holding up in work. and, and Everything not- in the office, not leaving mm-hmm. to the pokey bar downstairs, not mm-hmm. going to the burger shack across the street. And so the restaurants are upset because apparently their food doesn't taste good enough for the, the workers to go and patronize them. Free tastes good, man. Yeah. Free does taste good. To be clear, I think, is it that they were banning the cafeterias? They're banning kind of industrial style kitchens within these, within these companies? Because if they're just passing out free apples one day, it can't yeah, like them. I, I, I doubt they're banning granola bars. Like we're going to get right. in trouble, you know? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I doubt they're banning <laughs> snacks. Yeah. 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 But I guess, yeah, it is kind of like the the large, uh, I guess, the large serving of, large preparation and serving of food in a designated dining mm-hmm. hall, maybe. Right. I mean, I'm yeah. thinking that's what right. it is. It just, it seems silly. It just seems like they're incentivizing companies to not go there. Because if I had a company and I want to offer perks to my employees, such as a delicious cafeteria mm-hmm. for free, then fine, I just won't be in San Francisco. I'll go to San Antonio. I'll go anywhere else. And well, it, it does seem like more and more companies are actually leaving San Francisco mm-hmm. and California to go to places like San Antonio or Austin or other places in Texas. Those two states, respectively, are the the biggest net out migration in California in the country. So more people are leaving California than people coming in. They are number one in that rating versus Texas, who is number one in net inward migration. This is all according to U-Haul, which is, of course, the truck rental company that measures all of this. And they should know, right, because they're renting the trucks. Yeah. 
Actually, that reminds me. We had an article on the Fee website a couple of months ago about, I think in February, about how it's, people are finding it hard to find U-Hauls in places like San Francisco because so many people are leaving <laughs> one-way tickets out and the U-Hauls are going and not coming back. Oh. <laughs> and so we're seeing this sort of pattern continue, continue. Mm-hmm. My former state where I used to live and I worked for seven years, Illinois used to be number one in net outward migration. Now California is uh, number one in net outward migration. And Dan Mitchell on our mm-hmm. website, one of our authors, actually notes that we continue to see an increasing amount of net outward migration in these high tax, high regulation yeah. states. People want to get out. People don't like the experience of having high taxes and having restrictions on what they can do and what their places of work can do. Yeah, I mean, because this is just really the tip of the iceberg. I mean, it's just, they're, they're a very ban-happy governments <laughs> in, in, in California. They just, uh, it, it's, it's, it's almost creative how how much they're finding different things to, to ban. They're um, banning entrepreneurially. Mm-hmm. They're actually finding <laughs> entrepreneurial <laughs> right. ways to ban things. Mm-hmm. So it's New somewhat of a credit. Bans. Right. Well, yeah. it's, more, it's more like that they're opening up the entrepreneurship, so to speak, of other states to be mm-hmm. less ban happy mm-hmm. and to, to attract them. Because in, sim- similar to what you were saying, that there's like... Uh, you know, out migration of people who are fleeing uh, p- places with high taxes, high regulation, where it's hard to get a job, it's hard to hard, hard to find a place to live because of all these government regulations. That it's it's the um, states, especially who have less of a burden, uh, that that are drawing a lot of these. Um, the, the, this migration. So we have this other article called "Americans Are Voting with Their Feet for Economic Freedom," and there, uh, there was re- recently a release of the um, the migration data for um, inbound states versus outbound states, and um, and one finding was that the average top individual income tax rate in the top five inbound states is 4.9% compared to 7.7% in the top outbound states. So you can even see patterns where the inbound states tend to have lower taxes and the outbound states tend to have higher ones. And um, and, and another uh, case is that... um, um, I'm sorry, I, I, I lost my place there, but but you, you, you get the point. <laughs> yeah, and so it seems to be a pretty good connection between those people who are leaving a high-tax state, right? So that's one of the reasons they could be leaving, according to the data, and going to places where they have to pay less mm-hmm. in tax. That seems to be a fairly strong connection. And so this concept, voting with your feet, yeah. mm-hmm. is something we hear a lot, but maybe not necessarily something that we've really defined very well. Well, basically, when you vote with your feed, you're expressing your preferences. Usually, we think about this as the actual physical migration, and you might be voting with your feet to leave a place, or as Dan was mentioning, you might be voting with your feet to enter a place. Yeah, and the thing about voting with your feet is that it's very practical. It's not ideological. You you, you might have certain preferences in terms of how you, how you vote and, and what you think ideally w- would happen. But when, it, when like the rubber meets the road and you actually have to live somewhere and you ha- actually ha- have to deal with um, the, the tax burden, with, with the job climate, even though you, you might not even realize why, you're, you're, uh, why the climate is so bad, the, the economic climate is so bad in, in one state, it still has the effect that the, the, that the states with the, the, the more reasonable uh, pol- economic policies will tend to draw mm-hmm. people in, and the ones with less so will, will push them out. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a very, it's a very, when you boil it down, the concept is, um, I mean, we can talk, we, it, what's so, I guess, applicable about voting with your feet is that you can apply it to something as small as, you do really care about the fact that, you know, we don't want straws, so I'm going to vote with my feet by choosing to um, patronize a company that doesn't use straws. Right. That is voting mm-hmm. with your feet as much as moving to a new state right. or, yeah, moving to a new country, something like that. And so voting with your feet is really just a way to express your values without having mm-hmm. to go into Right. And it's voluntary. And Mm -hmm. as you're saying, it's people are revealing their preferences. And it may be different from the preferences that they put on social media, for example, which is a very interesting notion, too. So (laughs) we'll get back to that and we'll get back to more after we take a quick break after these messages. Hi, I'm Sean Malone, director of media for Fee.org. 
Of course, you already know about Fee's incredible articles and written content. But did you know that you can also watch our fantastic videos and listen to our podcast at our website as well? Visit fee.org slash shows to get the latest content from the series you love, such as Out of Frame, Common Sense Soapbox, How We Thrive, The Words and Numbers Podcast, and, of course, The FeeCast. Once again, that's fee.org slash shows for more great content like this. Thanks for watching. Welcome back to the FeeCast. We've been talking about voting with your feet, also sort of voting with your pocketbook. In the case of a commercial exchange, you can choose whether or not to patronize a certain store. Um, and so this brings up a larger point that we have not yet really referred to in this sense, but a friend of Fee's, a former coworker of ours, Max Borders, has an event that actually uses this, this concept in its name. And this concept is called Voice and Exit. And it's al developed by a guy named Albert Hirschman, and he lived sometime in the 20th century, and he was basically formulating ideas about how people can interact with uh, commerce or even with government. And that's the sense that, that Max, at his Voice and Exit uh, show, his event, actually uses it. And so what exactly is this juxtaposition between voice and exit? Well, when you, ha when you express your voice that you, you might do that in politically. You might do that on a, by um, arguing with people about, about politics. You might do it by, at, at the voting booth. Uh, in commerce, you might do it by purchasing something. Mm -hmm. or, or exit, that's withdrawing association. So the, the freedom of disassociation. So politically, you might actually withdraw from, you might emigrate, you might, you might out-migrate. Um, or, or in commerce, you might withhold your dollars. You might boycott even. And so this idea that um, the, to the extent that you can withdraw from association, that that in itself is powerful because people want to associate with people. And so in order to compete for your... Um, Patronage your, or your tax dollars, right? Mm -hmm. That that other other people are, are going to have to to try to accommodate you and try to compete and um and 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 attract you. Yeah. And so this is a very important concept because you, the idea is these are different ways to exercise your preferences, right? Yes. You can choose to leave or exit. You can choose to be loyal and stick with it, whether it's a company or a state of California. Mm -hmm. Or you can choose to express your opinion otherwise. Say what you'd like to have changed. Mm -hmm. Vote, like you mentioned, Dan. Mm -hmm. And so this concept we're bringing up because it relates directly to the notion that we were discussing earlier, voting with your mm -hmm. feet. And people actually voting with their feet, exiting the state of California, for example, for Texas. And so... Different people want different things out of their life. And the notion of exit in a political sense is what we're going to talk about now. Um, sort of why people could make the decision and, and how they could make the decision to interact with their local communities. And, and what kind of impact that that has on the decisions of the governments of those communities, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. yeah, I was just going to say that I this it reminds me so much of when we saw a couple of states first legalize marijuana and now we're That's up right. to 30 states that have legal medical marijuana and another nine states and Washington DC that do legal recreational. It just started with a couple and they saw good results and then other states picked up on that and they imitated them. I'm glad you brought that up, Marian, because mm -hmm. marijuana pot generally is maybe considered more of a left-wing type of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Legalizing uh, drugs uh, in that sense. But there's also actually do, doing things on things that are considered more right-wing, such as firearms and mm -hmm. guns. Right, choosing to live in a state where there's friendlier gun laws. Right, and so mm -hmm. your notion of you know where you want to live, what values you want represented in your community, in your state, mm -hmm. in your city, you can affect where you are, right, by exiting, mm -hmm. or you can affect what they're doing by voice. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that's why it's so great when you can kick, th kick policy decisions down from the federal level down to mm -hmm. the state level instead of having one policy towards drugs for the entire country. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have 
multiple policies and it's like little experiments where where yes. they they try it out and see how it works like see how overdoses uh the, the rate of overdoses mm-hmm. what, what happens in in states that that prohibit um, drugs versus the ones that allow it yeah and i think when you take it to a smaller scale there's so much more respect for the dignity of people and like dan said use the word experiment it's so much better to do smaller experiments than to have an experiment on 300 million mm-hmm, people, right, like mm-hmm. our population in the United States. Which is pretty unique in the way that the U.S. is formed from a government side because it's a federal system. You don't have a unitary government at the very top like they would, for mm-hmm. instance, in London. The parliament creates laws that are applicable all throughout the entire United Kingdom. At least in the United States, you have what they call these laboratories of democracy, where mm-hmm. if the federal government has a constraint on it through the Constitution, that it can't regulate or can't create a law, then the states in many cases can actually do that. And that brings it much further down to a local level. And and again, these experiments are connected because part of the experiment is like, okay, which attracts the most taxpayers? And how do they interact together? How does Texas interact with California when there's such a disparity between the environments there? Yeah, uh, I, I really love this uh, term that Daniel Mitchell, one of our frequent writers, has jurisdictional competition. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Explain that, the term. So it's the idea that, um, that when you have multiple jurisdictions and there is freedom of migration from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, that again, people are able to vote with their feet. Mm-hmm. That if there are bad policies, one way of, that you could tell whether these policies are bad or not if pe- is if people flee them. And, uh, and if you have good policies, then one way that a criterion for that is if people are, are drawn to them. And so governments are incentivized to compete with each other for taxpayers. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so, that, so they, you, you can't be too oppressive or, or else you will lose that competition. Yeah. Ilya Soman, to paraphrase him, he kind of describes voting with your feet as having power to pick your political regime. Mm-hmm. Of course, there's there are some barriers. I mean, voting with your feet, it sounds it sounds nice. But is it that easy to just pick up and go if Atlanta mm-hmm. passes laws that I don't like? Well, I've got a lease on my apartment and I've I work here. It's not as easy for some people. Yeah, there are definitely barriers to exit. And I think that one of the ways that we can maybe improve, improve um exit or make exit easier is to yeah innovate ways to make barriers lower right so that's one of the things that we can as individuals as decision makers um do is, is that we can make we can make barriers lower or figure out ways or innovate ways to make barriers lower to exit and so over um, the past few decades we've had more and more focus on people having voice right we've enfranchised mm-hmm. many new people the uh, enfranchisement of women, the enfranchisement of former slaves and, and people who weren't freeborn white males, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That's happened slowly but surely over the past few centuries here in the United States. And is the concept of voice sort of been overplayed at this point? Should we focus mm-hmm. more on exit? I mean, I think both both are powerful. Having having the ability to to vote or to withhold your dollars and to get up and go, I think that they lend themselves to one another. And I, and I think that the smaller the jurisdiction, that the cheaper the exit is. Because like you said, mm-hmm. there, there are barriers to exit. Well, if you are in the middle of like imperial China and, you know, you have one emperor for, you know, thousands and thousands of miles in every direction, that's a really expensive exit. Mm-hmm, right. um, and so, <laughs> so the smaller you have of, the, of these polities, then the, then the easier it is to, to jump across the border. A polity, in this sense, you mean like a jurisdiction. Yes. Mm-hmm. The, the different areas through which people are moving uh, to and from. Right. And the notion here, again, is uh, exit is not always something that's costless, right? I mean, you can choose very easily not to patronize a shop across the street instead of uh, another shop. But things like gentrification, this is a concept mm-hmm. that a lot of people in the inner city are concerned about today because uh, you either have uh, new people moving into a neighborhood, rising, raising all the prices of the real estate so that the mm-hmm. taxes that people pay on their properties becomes unaffordable. What do you do then? You get another grocery store that's across the street that's instead of the Rite Aid that you used to buy things Mm -hmm. at is a Whole Foods. The prices are much higher. Mm -hmm. What is a person Mm -hmm. to do? So gentrification in this sense can be a problem that's understood. But your point Mm -hmm. is that we should make the barriers to exit much lower. Yeah, we should just encourage. I mean, again, thinking about how entrepreneurs can 
innovate ways to decrease barriers. I mean, that's something that you think, I mean, we can apply this to anything, but really it's, I mean, applying innovations um, to barriers to exit, like now we have planes when we only had boats. I mean, yeah. thinking about how we yeah. can, as individuals, make it easier for exit to be a possible solution, because you're right, there's so much voice now. It's like, people say they're moving to Canada, but is anyone moving to Canada, you right. know? And <laughs> right. And, and even when you can't physically exit, you can digitally exit in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Like the, anyway. that if you, um, with cryptocurrencies or, or with inter internet commerce mm -hmm. or, or with, um, you know, working, working for a company in, a, in another country, that, that to, to some extent that these are borderless um, uh, exchanges mm -hmm. and, and people can, uh, if, if there is a, a good policy in, in one country and you can um, partake of that industry over the internet, then you you can benefit from the uh, th those good policies. Right. And, yeah. Right. So we have a lot more to talk about, a lot more in the weeds to get to, um, but we're going to exit this segment of our fee cast and go into the next one after a couple of messages. Oh boy, you know, starting out in the in the music business or in just any business, you have to have the carrot dangling. You have to know what your goals are. I think if anybody goes in without a goal, you're pretty much doomed. This is a family business. Our daughters, our son-in-law, my brother. We, we, we can't walk away from this. This is not something we walk away from. This is something we pass on. I mean, you're always gonna run into the wall. It's just, can you figure out how to go under it, around it, uh, over it? That makes, for longevity of a, of a business. You can't give up. You just don't let yourself give up. Watch Mama Gold Tone and more documentaries about women in business in our How We Thrive series at fee.org slash shows. Welcome back to the FeeCast. We've been talking about several ideas here. We've been talking about voting with our feet if we don't like a place that we happen to live in. We've been talking about exit versus voice, right? We have a lot of voice in our politics today in our conversations talking about whether exit is possible, whether it's costless, whether we can do things to bring the cost of exit down so that more people can exercise that option mm -hmm. instead of just complaining about things all day mm -hmm. on Facebook. Mm -hmm. But I one, like complaining. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things I want to talk about now is sort of when you talk about jurisdictions, which are these, these areas of certain power, right? And a jurisdiction really can be defined as uh, geographic or even a non-geographic area where a certain mm -hmm. authority is exercised, right? And if you don't like that authority, you can leave that jurisdiction. You've been talking, Dan, about the notion of federalism being able to kick down the authority or the power down to the local level. And so the next question I have is, what does local power or authority look like? When you, when you bring government down to the smallest level, what does that mean? What is the smallest level that makes sense? Well, I really agree with Ludwig von Mises, who once said this that, guy right here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is Ludwig von Mises, an Austrian economist who also had a lot to say about politics. And in one of his books, he um, he really advocated for um, the complete right of secession, that any any group of people uh, should be able to secede from whatever. Um, larger jurisdiction they're, they're part of. Secession, of course, is separation, saying, I'm out, we're going to get out of this mm -hmm. altogether and exit. Yeah. And his, he said that if it were practical, that really that should be extended down to the level of the individual. Mm. So, so to me, that, that's the ideal size of, of, of sufficient smallness is, is down to the individual. <laughs> Whoa, <a> radical. <laughs> I did not think he was going to go there with sufficient smallness. I think that sufficient smallness is a concept that um, at least economists toss around a lot when they are talking about how we apply policies, um, especially, I think, from a market-driven um, or you know, individual choice-driven uh, model. Specifically, I think about how sufficient smallness is something that people explore when you're talking about um, you know, uh, pro uh, property rights and conserving resources. You have to have sufficient smallness for that to work. Um, sufficient smallness is, um, yeah, is something kind of, I think that it's a moving target depending on what goods and services you're talking about, what individuals you're talking about, um, what 
kind of values you're trying to inform or you are or, or are being informed um, or are informing your decisions. Right. So sufficient smallness, I think, is um, is obviously a moving target. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think part of what you're getting at is the, the this fear that, okay, well, if we get too small, then we're not going to have enough uh, of diverse resources to, to sustain ourselves. But like you have like Hong Kong, for example, which is just a city state. And they are very natural resource poor because this is very small, but they're very rich at the same time. Mm. So the, the idea is that um, that you trade with with other resources. So, I mean, with, with other countries, other jurisdictions, yeah. other people who have things that you have or that you don't have that you want. And they can actually produce for you at a cost that you're willing to pay. Of course, this is the hallmark of the free market system. Yeah. yeah. When I think about my ideal for a sufficiently small community, I tend to think of it as being small enough where people can get what they want. And what I mean by that is in terms of urban planning, that all the people who want a lot of public parks and public spaces, that they can go to a community of like-minded people and they can all vote to, to do that with their tax dollars. Whereas people who don't want to pay for those parks, they can go to a community with other like-minded people and they won't have parks and then everybody wins. This has implications yeah. not only for a uh, city with its city next door that happens to have values that you might prefer over the mm-hmm. one where you are, but also states, right? right. There, are no, cool. there are no real barriers between mm-hmm. states if you want to move. There are mm-hmm. also uh, implications for international borders right. as well. Mm-hmm. But you, you scaled up, but even to scale smaller, going from a city to neighborhoods. Yes. Mm-hmm. And most people who move within states are choosing their neighborhoods. When we cross state um, and even county, when we cross county lines, that's usually when people are moving for jobs. Mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. Well, and the other notion there, of course, when you're talking about scaling even lower, is a subdivision, mm-hmm. a private mm-hmm. sort of homeowners association is a kind of jurisdiction yeah. Yeah. that you might at some point, even though you decided to move into it, want to exit because mm-hmm. the fees are too high, your neighbors suck, <laughs> uh, the dog keeps pooping on your lawn, and mm-hmm. no one does anything about it. And so jurisdictions aren't only government, but they're any kind of regime of power that Mm -hmm. we can either opt into, opt out of. The question is, to what degree it's easy to do those things. Yeah, I think Like communes. I mean, that's technically a jurisdiction. (laughs) A kibbutz. A kibbutz in Israel where (laughs) you come together and voluntarily, in theory, Mm. you are (laughs) are, uh, working on a communal basis with other people. You are harvesting all the goods in a communal sense. You're not keeping any for yourself. You're doing everything for the community. And one would hope that in this kind of modern... uh, voluntary commune that you would have the ability to leave with Mm -hmm. no problem. Yeah. Yeah. I think an important point is that political fragmentation does not necessarily mean economic fragmentation, that you can have a global division of labor, even when with like really small, um, you know, Balkan, uh, politically balkanized city states that, and and balkanized meaning very fragmented, very small. Yes. Yes. And in, in fact, you're more likely to have free trade with those because the, the bigger the jurisdiction, the more they can afford a policy of economic isolation. Whereas, uh, again, um, a jurisdiction as small as Hong Kong, basically they have free trade forced on them. That That's the only way that they, they can prosper. In order to get things that mm-hmm. they need. Yeah, okay. And, and similarly, political fragmentation does not mean cultural fragmentation, that, that you can have uh, a, a big community with, with uh, people speaking the same language, even having the same religion, having the same um, customs and norms, mm-hmm. um, but having different political um, jurisdictions within that. And so what you're basically saying, Dan, is even if you do have very small sort of uh, voluntary uh, authority jurisdictions, uh, that doesn't mean necessarily that everyone's on their own, right? Yes. That you don't talk mm-hmm. with anybody, you don't share a culture with anybody, that you're all, you know, growing everything you need on your little plot of land, mm-hmm. and right. that's it, right? You still have the ability to trade with other people to get what you need, right? Yeah. which is an important difference from yeah. some of the ways that we think about isolationism mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. in other senses. It's actually mm-hmm. the opposite of isolationism because it pushes your community to exchange what it needs back and forth versus, like you said, like larger communities... I mean, larger, I mean, large countries that are under some sort of authoritarian regime uh, actually can isolate themselves easier. Right. Yeah. Um, 
So smallness actually lends itself to a more almost like you have to be willing to exchange with others. Yeah. Lots so is like more. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. even now you have uh, the, the European Union, which is trying to make Europe into a, a super state that the European Union, even though it, it, it establishes free trade wi within Europe, mm -hmm. it is hugely protectionist mm -hmm. outside of Europe. And it can afford that protectionist policy to, to some extent because it's it, sufficiently large. Right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the, what made Europe rich in the first place was its political fragmentation that, that uh, throughout the Middle Ages and, and, and after the Middle Ages, as it grew rich and into the Industrial Revolution, that, that no one power was able to centralize control over all of Europe, that you had lots of different countries, lots of different city-states, but you had a lot of commerce in between that and a lot of cultural unity, too. So you had a lot of experimentation. In many ways, you had a lot of progress from those elements of experimentation that were allowed to flourish underneath all these different competing jurisdictions, unlike where you mentioned in China, Imperial China, mm -hmm. everything under one unitary state. And, you know, God help you if you deviate from whatever they wanted to do in Beijing. Yeah. yeah. So if an, uh, if an emperor of China j decided, oh, well, OK, you know, printing is no good then printing was no, 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 no printing throughout, throughout the entire the realm. Whereas in Europe, it's like, okay, you, you, you won't let me do printing in this country. I'm just going to hop across the border. And yeah. that's what happened over and over again. That's what I was going to ask if there was a lot of physical migration that was taking place as well during that time in Europe. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what's the high note that we can end on here? Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have some degree of jurisdictional competition mm -hmm. here in the United States. If you love plastic straws, move to Georgia. We'd love to have you here in Georgia. <laughs> uh, and if you don't like straws, California awaits, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the only thing that needs to happen is for us to figure out how, again, now that we focus so much on voice as a society, how we can focus more on exit, how we can yeah. get it possible, make it possible for people to afford either you know culturally or spiritually or uh, socially or fiscally, right, to move from one place where they don't agree with things to another place where they do. I think we need to encourage innovation, uh, again, to decrease barriers to exit so that we can then encourage exit. Um, and, that, and because through exit, we, we empower individuals um, to truly live their values right. and whatever they want to do, whether that is having straws or whether that's not having straws. Um, I think that exit is so critical to, I mean, to ultimate human progress. Um, and I think that, so encouraging innovation, um, I think is one of the keys to encouraging exit. And I think that innovation could look like a lot of things that could like, like Airbnb that could mm -hmm. like, that could resemble certain ride sharing yeah. uh, companies mm -hmm. that give people greater access to leaving. Yeah. It could mean lowering property taxes. Mm -hmm. It could mean doing mm -hmm. other things that make it possible for people to live their values, which, of course, we at FEE love living our values. Our mm -hmm. values are many, and you can find those out on our website. One of our values is not to take too much time beyond which uh, what we've promised. So we're going to end it right here. We would love to see you next week at the FEECast. Look up all of our other episodes on our YouTube and Facebook channels. In the meantime, have a great weekend. Mm -hmm.